I know that you've been uh, hearing broken promises for decades about the redevelopment of Liberty Square and other public housing communities. And I'm here tonight to tell you that the promises that I made have not been broken. Families are afraid that they're going to be broken up. And when you start moving people out, you know, they won't be able to stay in this area. So people say that at that time, people had their own gardens in the Living Square Housing Project. People slept with their doors and windows open. Everybody knew everybody. People took care of each other's children. Uh, you rarely heard of uh, people being harmed or, or, or threatened. I'm here to reiterate my commitment to doing the right thing for the residents of Liberty Square. The project opened in February of 1937 to great fanfare. It had already been the number one visited site, uh, tourist site in South Florida. The one thing our parents told us, you couldn't go on the other side of the wall, because on the other side was, it was white. It was nice, it was beautiful, we could leave our doors open, go to work, go to sleep, and we had to worry about nobody breaking in or anything like that. Our goal all along has been to work together to build a new Liberty Square because you all deserve it and it's the right thing to do. When they're living in a war, they can't run from it because it's there. This is where we are in a war. We can't run from it because the next house we go to, it's over there too. You understand? So that's what we need to clean up, the violence. So here is a community that um, has more than, than sort of superficial needs and where media coverage can, can do something beyond simply, uh, you know, getting, getting web clicks. Flashing lights, bullet holes, and teddy bear memorials have become so common here in the Liberty Square housing project. Ask any neighbor and they'll point out multiple spots around their homes where people were murdered. Words matter how you describe places and how you reference them because then it becomes like a tag. You know, again, when, when you normally hear about Liberty City, it comes with a preceding adjective, crime-stricken, um, crime-ridden. Miami-Dade County Mayor Carlos Jimenez announced his plans to transform Liberty Square, instilling hope and even bringing tears to some eyes that have seen tragedy after tragedy. Y'all don't live there, and some people have been there all their lives. And it's not a bad thing, it's bad. That's where they're comfortable at. That's a historical site. We are concerned about fairness. We are concerned about injustice and making sure that people have the right to choose. People here want to keep their legacy going on. There's a lot of people that grew up in this area who like to see the legacy of this area keep going. A lot of people don't know their history and what we have because once it's gone, you can't recoup it. And if you don't talk about it, if you don't share it, the young people don't know it. They don't know what they have. And if we don't fight to keep it, you know, it's gone. My name is Carla Hansberry. I moved here in 2010. I've been here for maybe about four or five years now, going on six. I have uh, six beautiful kids. Living here, raising my kids on my own, it was hard. It was very hard, but I learned to grow. I learned to deal with it. I, I learned to adjust to it because, you know, if you don't go through the things that you go through, you'll never learn. My name is Darquizis Dixon. Um, I'm, a, I'm 19 years old. I will be 20 October 29th. Um, I attend Bethune Cookman University studying a major business management. Um, I've been living here in Liberty City for about seven to eight years. We moved down here from Fort Lauderdale in my sixth grade year. My name is Jennifer Hansberry. I'm 18 years old. I just turned 18 on May 14th. I also just recently graduated from Miami Northwestern on June 9th. And yes, I will be attending Bethune Cookman as well in the fall. Once we finally moved down here, it was 
it was like a movie or something. It was like the things that happened, I could have sworn I only seen those in movies. Like the whole first week, I think it was sleepless night because of like violence, like shooting. Um, we was like terrified to the point where when it happened, we were ducking down low. I taught my kids well that you don't have to follow trouble even when it comes your way. You, are, you have choices in your mind that you can make. They, they had to grow up quick because they were trying to keep their sister safe. It sounds crazy to say that you adapted to drive-bys and shootings and stuff, but that's just how it is. Like I lost a friend but I wasn't there. And then, okay, you know, it was hard to get through that. But then again, there was another friend that I lost and I was actually there. And you know, looking at him laying there and like blood and everything, like I was in the shock like for a long time. I didn't come out, I didn't speak or do nothing. I can honestly say besides all the, the bad part, it's a lot of talented kids and people here like, that actually stays in this community. And we got to experience that for ourselves. Like we have, a lot of different parties and cookouts around here and even if you don't know the person they invite everybody they don't care everybody just come out and have a good time basically if you look at the history um basically it's saying that they didn't really too much care about the people who live here it's always hot you know this south florida um why would they give us a heater with no ac you know everyone around here they, they got they got to buy like three and four fans for each, almost each room and everything. And like, you know, that kind of make you think like what's going on, what's going on. They've experienced some things that, 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 you know, I never thought in life that they would experience, but you know, they learned from it, you know, seeing a lot um, over here with the shooting and, you know, friends of friends of friends. And it, it, it was just something, you know, like I said, it's not easy to adjust to, but you have to. Hey, I'm on my way. My mom, she's a survivor. She survived a lot. We struggled a lot. When we didn't have money and food, anything, my mom always found the way. And sometimes at night, when she thought we would sleep, we heard her up crying, scratching and stuff, trying to figure out where her, she could get the eye net support from. She would go without just so we can have, man. You know, a lot of people say, you know, how their mom's the best, but, you know, I feel like as if my mom's not the best, she's the greatest. So I wouldn't be who I am if I want for my mom. I'm just grateful for her. This Tony. Yeah, this big Tony. Yeah, what's up, baby? My name is Carl Gray, a.k.a. Big Tony. And I'm, I'm from Liberty Square, you know, AKA Poking Bean. This is where I come from. This is basically where everything that I learned and acquired in life started right here. Oh, this was white sand. We used to have swings, um, merry-go-rounds. We had, it was fire engine. We, it was like we could come out. All the kids could come out and play. But I grew up right there. President-elect Franklin Delano Roosevelt came to Miami before taking office uh, and uh, during that time he was taken to Colored Town and the President-elect was shown the conditions in Colored Town at that time which were very very crowded. The areas where black people were living were limited in space and scope and were becoming denser and denser. And uh, Roosevelt said he would do something about that when he got to Washington. Well, what he did was uh, authorize the uh, building of the Liberty Square housing project. Liberty Square was really the first project to expand what had been 
decades of, of these traditional boundaries for um, black residents in Miami. When the government proposed putting that housing project there, that was a white area. There were not a lot of black people living up there. And some of the white folks, probably a great many of them, did not want blacks moving across a certain line. One person writing a letter called black expansion in Miami like a, like a bonfire gone, gone out of control. So they physically built a wall, now called the segregation wall, to limit where blacks could actually buy property and live. During segregation, this wall had separated the African American from the Caucasian neighborhood. So the people who had lived in Liberty Square housing development had us to get a pass actually to leave this neighborhood and this wall had separated them. This wall plays a very significant role in the history of African American in this neighborhood. You could not go over that wall because on the other side was, it was white and they didn't allow it to come on that side. That side of 12th Avenue on back was white. So what we didn't have money then, back in the early 60s, you understand me, coming up to get a bike. We weren't able to get a bike, but I'd go and get me a bike because i stand right down the corner, me and my boys, and we wait till we see Billy. They go, Billy, Billy riding by <laughs> with his little bicycle with the screamers ride, flying in the wind. Next thing you know, I have Billy bike going back that way because I done took Billy bike, sad to say, you know. But that's how, that's what, it, that's what life dictated back then, you know, and we did what we had to do. People wanted to be there. They wanted to be around the housing project. That was the up and coming place to be. It was the first public housing in the southern part of the United States um, where that African American could have indoor plumbing, um, have a shower. And just imagine back then, back then, um, African Americans were concentrated in overtime. So you had a lot of school teachers and business people building their homes around the housing project. People were proud of their their homes. They were proud of their the gardens and the and the amenities that they um, that they added to their to their homes at, at uh, Liberty Square. People who moved there, they knew that they were moving there for better living conditions because of how the government or mandated that that project be built. And as a result of that, it was so much pride, even from the outside in, meeting the yards, the, it was the shrubbery and the, you know, the grass. It was part of that social um, engineering of the working class that the, that the New Deal was so determined to, um, to engage. It was actually one of the most modern spaces to move into at the time. And, families would live there and they're like, wow, you know, there's indoor plumbing here. And, you know, so at the time when it was built, it was really up to date. It was the best place to live. Oh, it was simply beautiful, simply marvelous, beautiful families. I was on the famous street for skating. <laughs> so Christmas, we couldn't even go out the back door. It was just, when you woke up at five o'clock, you heard the skating and it stopped maybe six o'clock that night. The parents didn't have to wear where the kids were going. I never had a key to my house. We never had a key. We just come in and go and come. My experience in this project here was lovable. My time here, I enjoyed it, you know? I got so many memories that because I learned a lot. You, you, you grow up kind of fast, you know, because you had to. You know, you had you had more than one mama and more than one daddy. You had more than one brother and you had more than one sister. Everybody was your parent. If you done something wrong, you you can take care. That parent can take care of you. It was a no. It was just it, it was love. is why it happened. The downtown white power structure wanted that land in Overtown to be available for downtown to expand to the west. And that meant that the expressway needed to be farther west so that this could, this could take place. You have a population in Liberty City that actually were displaced from Overtown and were displaced because I-95 came through their neighborhood, a thriving neighborhood, and obliterated it. It was, it was, Intentional, it was, I think, criminal 
to have done that to Overtown for the mere fact that the business community needed land to expand. And uh, the black community in Overtown is still paying the price for that. After they started building the, what you call I-95 and they went through Overtown and it made it displace a lot of people. And what they call Jennifer Keaton, that was one of the first things. So we basically came out here to Liberty Square. So now you had what had been a fairly model blue collar and then really up and coming black enclave in Liberty City swamped with all of these folks who had been displaced by that expressway. When I came back from college after being away for four years, the interstate appeared. It was miraculous, it was incredible. The first time I took it, I couldn't believe it. And then I noticed that it elevated itself over Overtown so that if you really didn't want to see black people, just don't look down. And so it was. I was up there. I went to Liberty Square. I went up to the to the housing project uh, that afternoon. I got a call from a reporter. He said, do you know they're killing people up on 62nd Street? I was at home in Coconut Grove in shock because the verdicts had just been announced. So I drove up to 62nd Street and 12th Parkway by the housing project and saw hundreds of people by that time pouring out of that project, out of those apartment buildings, into the street, um, and no police. Well, if you look at Liberty Square, you know, the riots uh, of, of the 1980s still kind of hang over that community. And, you know, if you, if you want to understand the present, you have to understand the past. I saw this boy, he was maybe 18, lying in the median strip. I thought it was a bundle of clothing someone had discarded. It was this cult boy. And uh, there were about 15 young black men surrounding the other brother. This was right at the Liberty Square Housing Project, on the property of the housing project, um, using a Miami Herald newspaper box to kill this other boy in broad daylight with thousands of people, at least hundreds of people watching, including me. And a lot of that anger came out of that housing project. And we can go anywhere, up and in, all over, and it wasn't up, you didn't hear no gunshots and all that there, you know? So that, 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 that really bothered me because it made an impact where everybody got the wrong perception of the, of the project. So for about maybe two decades, the Liberty Square Housing Project grew Black Miami's leadership, grew the teachers, grew the police officers out of that housing project. And then it started to fall apart. But for a long time, it was the, the um, the bedrock of, of that community, and it was the place where people went to do better and to be better, and they were. I remember being jealous of the folks who lived in Liberty Square because there was such a community there. You know, like the neighborhood I grew up in, like you didn't know your neighbors that closely. You couldn't go to your friend's house. Like it was, you know, you can't cross the street, you might get hit by a car and things like that. But my friends who lived in Liberty Square, you know, they would talk about going to the Candy Lady house and every housing project has the Candy Lady and, you know, going to buy frozen cups and hot sausages and pickled eggs and those types of things. And, and I'm like, I want that, I want a Candy Lady. This idea of trying to find a new way to house those who need housing, who are not otherwise able to start 
and jumpstart their own lives, I think is an incredibly important contribution. It was a lot of people in this park that, that, that meant something, you know, to us. You understand what I'm saying? And, and to this day, a lot of those people still had a, the, the, the poking bean, what we call the poking bean, in them. Regardless of what they done spread it out in life, this is ground zero. There's an annual picnic where we always give out our scholarship. And it's so good to see people on this side of the grave, and that's what it's all about, being together, frank, friends and family, and having fun. Usually when we get together like this, it's at a funeral, and we decided, no, we need to meet on a happy note. So now we meet on a happy note, and then we feel good when we do something positive with when we have things that not it's not just the money, but it's giving back. So we give back to those that our roots come from Liberty Square. Last year's recipient, Mr. Doc Davis Dixon, which is the brother of I remember it being a nice place to live. Kids in certain areas, they had to go to the bathroom outside. We didn't. We didn't have that. We had running water inside. I'm, I'm getting there. Something needs to be done to it because it's old and they need, if they're going to rebuild it, fine, but they need to also remember the people that are living in there now and don't exclude them when they rebuild. At new at six, one of South Florida's most notorious housing projects could soon be wiped out and replaced with a brand new complex. Project supporters say the move will crack down on crime and revitalize a very depressed part of Plans Liberty City. Plans are underway City. to raise crime-ridden Liberty Square in Liberty City. Also on 7, Miami's oldest and most notorious public housing project is getting a makeover. 7's Lorena Estrada in Liberty Square with the details. I just want what's fair for this community that they deserve. At the end of the day, you got 700 and something families there that's public housing residents. We need 700 and some public housing residents going back in there. Because you are uprooting their lives. Liberty Square! 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 Liberty People are coming together, making sure that we have a great environment to grow up and that our children okay. grow up in. Liberty Square! Liberty Square! Liberty Square! definitely something to keep an eye on, you know, for the community, for the media, you know, how does this play out in this landscape at a time where we are talking about major issues that are affecting Miami, such as affordability, such as housing, access to transportation, um, schools. I'm going to be open and we're going to do articles. We're going to make sure that everyone hears what my struggle is. Can we stop it? Can we slow it down? What can we do? And. Uh, my heart tells me, just talk about it. There is a fear that whatever is built in Liberty Square will, will be for somebody else. This is not the first redevelopment in the United States of America of a low-income neighborhood or public housing. And 90% of the people never came, come back. 90% of the people never benefit from tax dollars. 90% of the people never benefit from government investment in low to moderate income neighborhood. Um, and our fight and our argument is that, yes, you could redevelop a poor neighborhood and include everyone. We feel that our team is going to be able to work with the residents to, again, to make the public housing residents and the public housing units be a stepping stone. Public housing was not intended to be a multi-generational um, housing. 
y'all got to realize when they change the community, they changing a lot of people's status. A lot of these people got criminal records. Y'all got to remember that. So y'all can't just take them out the community because they still gonna have family and they still coming through. To have a chance to appreciate a great environment here in Miami-Dade County with the remodel and remake of Liberty Square would be great. But what we look at as now is though, the mayor, the chief of mayors and deputies, as though they're pulling our lead right now, we have to come to a normal agreement to know is the residents at 100% going to be grant guaranteed affordable housing area in the same area where they can adapt to that they know growing up as or to be stripped from their environment raised in. That's how we feel as Liberty Square residents. I got Facebook again. The money, somebody paying it, somebody getting it. All of it ain't coming here. You get me now? Come on guys, look. This, this ain't no 20 year project. Does this lift the neighborhood up? Will property values go up? Will this bring in more folks to live in the area? Um, there's been very real questions on whether or not, you know, what's being built is for the people here, or is it being built for some people who you want to be here at some point? The young people don't know it. They don't know what they have. And if we don't fight to keep it, you know, it's gone. And it's not a whole lot of history that we have in Miami dealing with the black community. We, my wife and I and, 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 and our group, we are trying to preserve the history of, of, of Liberty Square. Is it really gonna happen? The time, we know yeah. it's gonna take the time. Are we ready to move? If you talk to the old generation that been through this area, they got a passion. They got a passion for this area because this area nurtured them and fed them and made them who they are. So you always want to keep that intact and say, "This is this is my community. This is where I came from. This is what made me who I am." Members of the public will be given an opportunity to speak when the item is called. Mr. Chair, at this time you may extend to the public a reasonable opportunity to be heard. Not only are they going to take away your home that you have to live in, they're also going to put you in the back. On top of all of that, it will no longer be called the poker beans. Do it's going to be a new name. Allow the future of Liberty Square to be sacrificed. To the Redesign Almighty Project home. has a great opportunity to create the kinds of spaces that recognize the dignity of life and respect for a, for a As historically proud community. As an architect urban planner, it is my professional opinion that the related urban development has a better design solution provided. These more residents amenities. are long overdue for an update and an upgrade, uh, and that's why we've included them in the redevelopment process every step of the way. The right to live in peace, the right to, to eradicate the crime that is uh, rampant in that area, the right to live without rats and roaches, uh, that is their as right. As I stated and that's before, what, we should what I am left with is a disgruntled community pointing fingers at me as if I have set them up and forced the project on them, or an excited community pointing fingers at me as if I am attempting to Damn, deny them. Damn, if we have to sit back here and just listen to this and not react one way or another. How bad a situation may be, it's always like, you know, you can always get through it. There are always going to be some, you know, troubled people who's going to stop you from what you're doing, you know. You got to know how to look past that. 
So there's always going to be a time when you don't have it. So you just keep going until you get it. I've learned that not everybody that stays in this neighborhood is a bad person or a bad influence and to never judge a book by its cover. Living here has really, it changed our view of a lot, being naive to a lot of things. And we know, we know now.